Mike, M-I-K-E, Kamali, K-A-M-A-L-I. MD? Uh, yes. And please give me your title. Uh, Chair of Emergency Medicine, University of Rochester. Okay, so how busy is the ED now at Strong Memorial? So the ED at Strong has always been busy. Uh, really, the only time that we weren't busy was in March of 2020 when the numbers went down and everyone stayed home. Independent of that, we've always been very busy and it really depends upon the certain day, certain time of how busy we are. Are we extremely busy or just very busy? So that has continued all along and during the current surge, we continue to be busy. The volumes will go up and down a little bit dependent upon the day, at times some people will try and stay away from the hospital, but we continue to be very steady and very busy. So you're, you're not seeing any particular post-holiday spike right now? In terms of our volumes, no. Our volumes are roughly in line where they have been by their historical numbers. They might even be slightly down compared to historical numbers, but oftentimes that is just made up with the number of patients that are in the department at any given time. How about the urgent care centers? Yeah, now that's a very different story. So our, yeah. so our urgent care centers have seen some incredible volumes uh, over the past couple of months as people seek care and treatment and testing outside of the emergency department or outside of the primary care or pediatric office. Those numbers, are, some of them are up even three times what would be normal. And what are you doing about those volumes? How are you managing? Let's start with the ED and how you're managing the volumes. So all of, all of this, the volumes across our emergency departments and urgent care centers are compounded by our staffing and our difficulty with staffing some of our positions and having some of our people. In particular, we've had some difficulty with nursing staffing. Uh, and that's something that is being seen nationally and we are seeing it here in Rochester as well. For our emergency departments, we're trying to keep all areas open, but there are times that we have to close certain areas. Uh, we set up a tent outside our department at the beginning of the pandemic to help uh, with a number of patients, but unfortunately at times due to staffing, we have to close that and just have our staff working inside. For our urgent care centers, we have a little bit more flexibility there as those centers just run from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. Uh, but unfortunately, due to those staffing concerns uh, that we are also experiencing in urgent care, we had to close our Spencer Port Urgent Care to redistribute our staff to other sites. And then recently, due to high volumes, especially at a couple of our centers, we closed our parent and urgent care center so that we could redistribute that staff to our other centers to manage the very high volumes. So um, with these closures, the, the, the general strategy is to maximize your functionality, right? Can you speak a little bit to that and how, you know, there's a strategy behind these closures. It isn't just willy-nilly, there's, there's a plan. Sure. So the closing of any urgent care center is, is done under careful consideration. Uh, with our Spencer Port site that has been closed for some months now, it was just from the fact that we just did not have enough staff uh, to function and man all of our sites. So that was the first decision made. Uh, and it wasn't made lightly, but we decided to close Spencer Port because Strong West Emergency Department in Brockport is close by and gives people an alternative. In terms of the Parenton site and closing of, of that, one, it, although it was very busy, it had lower volume than our other sites. So at this point, we decided to place that under a temporary close so that we could take the staff and move them to Henrietta, Greece, uh, Penfield, and Henrietta. Uh, and Pittsford, I'm sorry, our, our other four sites to manage the very high volumes that we we're, were seeing in those sites. Uh, so currently we have open in our urgent care centers, Henrietta, Pittsford, Penfield, and Greece, which are all very busy seeing, yes, COVID patients, but also seeing other patients. Let me ask you a little bit about diversion. A lot of questions around that going back to October. Um, uh, tell me about diversion, whether it happens here so um, 
let's talk about some of the pati uh, let's patients. Let's define it first for sure, me what diversion sure. is. Um, let me jump back to uh, one urgent, urgent care thing that I think is a, a good point. Uh, with the high volumes that people have been reading about in our emergency department and urgent care centers, some people are putting off their health care and or going to urgent care when they have some significant injuries or illnesses. Uh, and urgent care can fit in as a stopgap between care and, and emergency care, uh, but it's not an emergency department. We have seen with those increases in patients in our urgent care centers, some very sick patients that ultimately then get transferred to the emergency department. So to some extent, many patients are choosing where they go uh, based upon what they are hearing. Our emergency department at Strong is fully functional. It's been running, we are busy, we are crowded. We have a lot of patients who are waiting for uh, beds upstairs that we're managing in our department, but we're still doing our best to manage every patient that is coming through the doors and really working to see the sickest patients first. Unfortunately, that does mean that some patients who aren't as sick wind up waiting in our waiting room longer than we would like, and we try and work through that. Diversion is when a hospital or an emergency department uh, notifies emergency medical services through the state that they can no longer accept any ambulance traffic. New York State is currently doing that under four-hour increments that requires approval from the Department of Health. Uh, across the state, many hospitals have gone on diversion, and in our region, we've had many hospitals uh, that have gone on diversion. Even some of our smaller EDs in the University of Rochester uh, health system. Uh, so, with that, what happens during that time? Ambulances won't present to that hospital, and then will be diverted to another hospital. And it might not be the hospital that the patient normally goes to. So that creates a. a couple problems uh, across the region for that when you have a patient arriving at your hospital who has never received care there before or who specialists might be at a different hospital. It's something we can work through, but it's not ideal. Diversion in Monroe County uh, really hasn't happened in over 10 years. Uh, because we came together, the, the two hospital systems, and decided that this wasn't in the best interest of patients. Having patients go to a different hospital when they had recent surgery or recent care uh, does not serve the patient well. And we decided that even if we were busy, it was still better to accept those patients into our hospitals than have them go elsewhere. Unfortunately, uh, Rochester General has been very, very busy in the past couple of weeks, and there's twice uh, that they have gone on diversion for four hours. They've communicated that with us. They've let us know. Uh, their emergency director there is in clear contact with us and communicates to us so that we can be prepared, and they work very hard to not go on diversion. So uh, not ideal, but also not unexpected given the current uh, situation. And, and probably um, media would want to know if you see that being a possibility here. Well, I never ruled, uh, so is diversion a possibility at, at Strong Memorial Hospital? Well, I, I will never rule anything out, but we are working very hard so that we don't have to utilize diversion because we don't feel it is in the best interest of patients. Um, so you touched on this, but you know when patients need emergency care, they should come to the ED or they should go to an urgent care. What are are you seeing? You know when you mention how busy the urgent cares are, are are you seeing patients that are coming in maybe with a recent positive COVID case where maybe they could have stayed home? Are there? Or are you mostly seeing that the volumes are warranted? So in, in our urgent care centers, we're seeing quite a wide variety that is driving the uptick in volumes. Some of that is people who have some mild symptoms or an exposure and they would like to have a COVID test. Uh, so some of that is, is for COVID testing. Some of it is people are, aren't feeling well and they'd like to be evaluated. They'd like to better understand what's going on. What are they dealing with? Is it COVID? Is it the flu? Is it strep throat? Something else? 
else. And then there are the standard urgent care complaints that people come in with, a, a broken arm, a sprained ankle, a laceration uh, that we continue to deal with. And then there are some people with some very significant injuries from a fall, from trauma, or medical illness that are coming in that they don't want to go to the hospital because they've heard of the long waits. Those people, of course, we try and see quickly, determine what is going on, and in many cases, we'll then wind up transferring those patients to the emergency department. Department. So what would you want, you know, all this is probably very confusing for the public and nobody plans to have a, you know, medical emergency. So what, what should people remember as a guideline uh, about when they think about if something happens, what should they, what would you like them to know about emergency care, urgent care, and what what the frame of reference should be for them, what they should do. So it, with regards to seeking care in either urgent care or an emergency department, uh, we at the University of Rochester, and I know our colleagues across town and across the country have done the same thing, uh, done their best to make sure that we are available at any point in time to take care of any patient in need. What we can't guarantee for you is how long the wait might be. But if you are ill or suspect you are ill, I think you should seek care, just like we've always done. The pandemic or COVID shouldn't prevent you from seeking care, and you shouldn't worry that your seeking care might prevent someone else from getting care. We're doing our best to manage all of it. What we don't want is to have someone who's putting off their care and then has a bad outcome because they didn't seek medical treatment. So if you think you need the emergency department, it is there. If you think it's something that maybe can be managed at urgent care, uh, it is there as well. We always encourage people to call their pediatrician, to call their primary care doctor, to use those existing resources, but we are there when we are, when we are needed. And um, people can refer to our website for a little more guidance on urgent care? Yeah, they can. We uh, On our website, we do have some common indicators for urgent care. Uh, I think some people understand those. We're limited in terms of our testing in urgent care, but we do have x-ray, we do have point of care testing, uh, and we do have uh, doctors, nurse practitioners, PAs, RNs uh, that are in our sites that are working to see our patients and take care of people. And of course, the emergency department offers uh, the whole gamut of testing and, and everything that that's needed, especially at a place like Strong, with every subspecialty uh, within uh, within the building. If you if you're a person that that um, needs a PCR test, there are other options besides. What's the guideline? What's the top recommendation for that? Is that the county or? Yeah, so great question about, about testing. So we have uh, actively uh, are working to dissuade people from coming to our, either our emergency departments or our urgent care centers for testing. That's so that we can take care of people that, that are sick. Uh, I understand that people want to test, they want to know what is going on, what they have, uh, and there are different thought processes on all of these. Yes, we'd like you to get tested, but there's also the thought being that in this current surge of of Omicron, uh, the COVID variant, that if you do have symptoms, it's probably likely that you have COVID. Um, and if you've been vaccinated, you should do just fine with that. But if you want to get a test, yes, the rapid tests have their role that they can play, that you can do at home. Uh, PCR test is the gold standard. So in addition, the county and state and the state is looking to do a few more things, uh, as well as some of the commercial sites. We're encouraging people to try and utilize those as much as possible that will then allow us in our urgent care centers and emergency departments to focus on the ill patients. What, um, I, I think you've covered this already, but what, what can patients and their support people um, expect to see when they come in right now? Into the emergency department yeah. or urgent yeah. care? Yeah. Sure, sure. So we, uh, 
there are several ways to get into the emergency department, basically two ways that you can get into the emergency department. You either walk in or you come in by ambulance. Coming in either of those ways, you're going to see a very busy department with a lot of people working hard to try and take care of uh, patients. If you're coming in with a loved one at a, as a visitor, we're going to do our best to try and accommodate you because we find that visitors are very helpful uh, for patients because oftentimes it's a family member that can help with the history, help with information, information uh, and also help with discharge planning. But there are times when we are just too crowded and we have to ask visitors to step out to either wait in the car or to go home and wait on a, on a phone call. And we ask for flexibility with that. And we're trying to be very, very conscious. Certainly a pediatric patient, we're not gonna send a parent home. Uh, we might ask one of the parents to step out and leave mom or dad there with the patient. And likewise with an elderly person or someone else who has needs, we will try and have a visitor there with them. So it, it changes a little bit minute by minute, which makes it tough because we're trying to accommodate as much as possible in our departments, but we're also asking for flexibility because especially in the evening time we can get very busy and the waiting room can get quite full. What, how are you and your staff kind of just taking it day by day to, to deal with, we might see higher volumes, we might not, but you know for two years you've been dealing with a lot of uncertainty, just what's the game plan on managing all of this? So uh, looking into crystal ball that everyone has been trying to look into and see what's going to happen, no, no one is really quite sure. I think with this current variant, the uh, numbers are spiking and going up very quickly, which to me means that they're going to come down very quickly. But when do they start coming down? No one really knows. I think that'll be in a couple weeks. We'll have some idea that data out of South Africa has been very telling. And it's also great great news in a way that this variant is uh, less severe than the previous variants and really less severe if you're vaccinated. So that information is actually helpful to us as we look at this and as we plan. We at Strong Hospital have been on a day-to-day -day basis looking at bed counts, capacity, OR cases, what's going on in the emergency department as well as other areas in outpatient settings and trying to adjust minute by minute, hour by hour, and day by day so that we can take care of all the patients that come to us. I think that strategy has been exceptionally effective in allowing us to remain open, do the urgent and emergent surgeries that we need to, the urgent and emergent care, as well as planning for everything else that is coming down the line. That strategy will also help us as things ebb a little bit and maybe slow down will allow us to open up things uh, very quickly, getting other patients in for those elective surgeries that were delayed. Um, so I've, I've been very confident in that strategy. Staff, however, are, are very tired. It's, it's been a long haul over two years, uh, and it's been a constant barrage of COVID news information that does seem to change. So at some point, we're just taking it slowly. We're continuing to do what we do, one patient at a time, one day at a time, uh, working to get the job done. This is what we signed up for. This is what we do, and we'll continue to work at it and, and deal with it as we can. We're also looking to the long future okay, how do we get more nurses? How do we retain people? What are the other strategies? What are some factors from technology and other angles that we can look at to continue to provide care uh, for our patients in our community, but then to look in the mirror and provide care for ourselves over the long term? So we're beginning to have some discussions on that also.